Um, good evening and welcome to tonight's service, um, whether you're joining with us here in person or you're watching at home on Zoom. And if you're a visitor with us, um, can I make you especially welcome to the service this evening? Tonight, our speaker is David Farrell, and he'll be commencing a new series in Philippians titled Discovering Joy. Philippians talks more about joy than any other letter, and it addresses a number of situations and attitudes which can cause Christians to lose their joy and slip into despair or discontentment. David's title tonight is Introducing the Church. To begin our service, let's stand and sing the words of Come People of the Risen King. This hymn speaks of the unity we have through our faith in Christ. Let's stand to sing this hymn after the introduction. And I kind of remind you just when you're standing to sing tonight to remember to put your masks on for that. Thank you. Our service before the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Dear Lord God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for being able to meet together on another Sunday to spend fellowship around your word. We pray for David as he opens up the book of Philippians to us. And as we look at this new series surrounding joy, we pray that we will recognize how peace and joy in times of despair come from you alone. Lord, we also want to give you thanks as a church for the safe arrival of Bonnie McMillan this week. We thank you for protecting Michael, Sophie, and Betsy over these difficult few months, and we pray that you'll be with them as they adapt to life now with Bonnie. 
Lord, we also want to pray that you'll be with all of the church activities in this coming week and as we look to disciple Christians and bring those who don't know you to faith. Lord, we commit this service before you and we pray for all these things in your son's name. Amen. I have just some announcements to bring to you. Um, as I just mentioned, um, we were delighted as a church this past week to welcome Bonnie uh, McMillan, um, a baby girl, to Michael and Sophie. Um, so just pray for the McMillans over the next few weeks and months as they adapt to life with baby Bonnie and the family as well. Next Sunday morning, we will be continuing our series um, in the morning, which is the Bible free from error. And Jim Crooks will be speaking on the topic is the Bible free from error? And next Sunday evening, we'll be continuing this series in Philippians, and Duncan Lannan will be our speaker, and his topic is what really matters. As I mentioned earlier, our speaker this evening is David Farrell. Um, David is well known to many of the church as one of the elders and one of our regular Bible teachers here at Crescent. David is commencing our, serve, our series in Philippians, and his topic tonight is introducing the church. But before David comes to speak to us, we're going to sing the words of the church's one foundation. And once we've stood to sing this hymn, I'll hand the rest of our time over to David. So let's stand to sing this hymn after the introduction.
Good evening, and thank you all for coming out this evening to join with us. I'm going to do something which I never, ever thought I would do. It's Halloween night. It's not even Remembrance Sunday. But I'm going to talk about a Christmas carol. Now, I know that Halloween finishes today, and if you go to the garden centers tomorrow, they'll be selling Christmas trees. But Christmas seems to get earlier and earlier and earlier. But I just want to talk to you for a moment about that little line in a chorus that you know, Christmas carol, joy to the world. Joy to the world. You all know the context of the carol. And whenever the world thinks of joy to the world, in particular at Christmas time or any other time, they think of something which is very immediate, very transient, something which is very, very quickly dealt with. You know yourself that you prepare for Christmas for weeks and end. Christmas morning is gone in a blink. Christmas dinner is gone and you're sleeping. And by the next day, it's all over. Is that, is that joy? Joy to the world? So what did the writer mean whenever he said in that Christmas carol, joy to the world? He wasn't referring to that transient, quick fix of joy that the world talks about. He's talking about something which is constant, something which is like a slow-moving stream right throughout your life. It is not something that doesn't mean that you don't have down times of grief and pain. It means that you will have that constant trust, constant confidence, constant dependence upon God and His truth and His promises and what they mean for your life. Maybe you're here tonight and you're looking for joy. Maybe you're looking for joy, which is something which is over like that. As we look at the book of Philippians, we're going to be talking about a joy which is something slower and constant throughout your life. We are looking at the journeys of Paul very briefly as we introduce the topic. Whenever you look at the book of Acts, you will find that there are a number of the journeys of Paul which are recorded. And if you're looking for what happened at Philippi, it's on the second journey. And predominantly, if you want to find out what happened at Philippi, you go to Acts chapter 16. It's a very lengthy chapter, and we're not going to take time to read it all tonight. If you want to take your time later on and read it in more detail, please feel free to do so. But I'm going to concentrate on one or two verses this evening from Acts chapter 16 and talk about what it meant for the establishment of the church in Philippi. Paul's second missionary journey went up through Galatia. It went across into Macedonia or Greece, and it came back to Jerusalem where it had originated. And Paul talks about it in this way. Therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran straight course to, uh, Sam- to uh, Samothrace, and the next day we came to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is foremost city of that part of Macedonia, a colony. And that is the verse I just want to focus on for the most of our evening together. So let's just break this down. It says we set seal from Troas. If you looked at the map, you would have seen that Troas was on the coast of Asia Minor. And whenever we, were, we read about Troas, and we read about Paul in Troas, there's a remarkable experience occurs. Paul has a vision. And the vision is from a man from Macedonia, if you like, a Greek, calling him to come that direction not to go back into Asia Minor, but to return back, to come back in his direction. And he, went on, he was to go on to the, the province of Bithynia, but he didn't. He turned and he went into Greece. 
Now, the significance of that little moment, that decision, has impacted you and me today. Because that was the moment that the gospel moved from Asia into Europe. And what we're seeing is the establishment of the first Christian on the continent of Europe. And we're seeing the establishment of the first church in Europe. And from there, the gospel spread out across Europe, across to us here in Northern Ireland today, and across all the continents into America and further beyond. So that decision, that call by Paul in Troas to come to Macedonia was highly significant. And then whenever he arrived, he arrived at the port city of Neapolis. And from there, he went to Philippi. Neapolis was a major port city. And it was connected to Philippi by a road, a Roman road, which was approximately 10 miles long, a day's journey. This is the actual road that the Apostle Paul would have walked on as he walked from the Apollos down to the city of Philippi. And when he arrived in Philippi, he came across a significant large city. It was a fortified city. It was a population made up predominantly of Roman citizens because it is called a colony. This is an artist's impression of what Philippi looked like. You can see the fortifications. You can see the high walls around about. And you can also see the road that Paul would have traveled on running and bisecting the city. But the fact that it is a colony is highly significant. In order to fully understand the book of Philippians, it's important that you understand the significance of what it meant to be a Roman colony. It's not a colony in the sense of the word that we use today. Right throughout the Roman Empire, as dotted on this little map, there were colonies established. And the people who lived in these colonies were given special privileges. They were uh, permitted to have a Roman citizenship. It was as if they were an inhabitant of Italy or of Rome. They had all of the rights that a Roman citizen would have had in Rome. If you look at it in one way, the man who came and occupied the colony of Philippi would have been retired Roman soldiers, possibly initially 500 of them. They came there onto the outpost. They lived there, and they considered themselves to be Rome. And this is very important whenever you come to study the book of Philippians, because a Roman citizenship is something which is very, very precious to Paul. And he says on at least three occasions, he defends his Roman citizenship. He used it whenever he appealed to Caesar. If you look at the end of Acts, he loses it whenever he was held in prison. And whenever you read in Philippi, in Acts chapter 16, when Paul was arrested, and when he was beaten, and then he was put into prison, it was then, he said, that they had beaten a Roman citizen. It was significant. It was a right. You couldn't touch, you couldn't harm a Roman citizen in that way. And so these people who lived in Philippi were very, very proud of their Roman colonial right. And so whenever Paul is writing to Philippi and to the Philippians, one of the things that he addresses to them is that they are Christians first and Romans second. Not Romans first and Christians second. And I think sometimes for us in Northern Ireland, that might be a very relevant and very applicable thing. Their national identity does not supersede their Christian position. They were Christians first, and they were Romans next. And this comes across in little phraseology and some of the terminology that Paul uses. Some of the language which Paul uses in the book of Philippians is very, very significant in this context. It is unique in the Bible, and it is unique to the book of Philippians. But then we move on, and we come to Paul's letters, and he wrote them throughout his missionary journeys and beyond. 
And whenever you come to Paul's letter, you find that he wrote the book of Philippians at the very, very end of his life. It is widely believed, although some would disagree, but it is widely held that Paul wrote his letter while he was in prison in Rome. All of the evidence, external evidence, suggests and does that. But more importantly, the internal evidence of the book of Philippians also shows that it was a Roman jail that he was in. In chapter 1 and verse 7, he says, I am in chains. In chapter 1 and 13, he says, the whole palace guard and everyone else that I am in the chains for Christ. It's interesting that he uses the term palace guard. And then at the end of the book, he says, greet all of God's people in Christ Jesus. All God's people have sent you, uh, uh, send you greetings, especially those belonging to Caesar's household. Again, internal evidence that Paul was writing from a prison cell in Rome. He may have been still under house arrest at this stage, but he was certainly in chains. And it is significant that he is writing a book from a prison cell to a group of Christians in Philippi, and he's writing from a very, very difficult position from him in his own life, and he's talking about joy. And that resonates right throughout the whole of the epistle whenever we're studying it. So when he's writing from prison, what is, what is the, the purpose of this little book? I'm only going to highlight some of the things because we're going to be looking at it in more detail. The first thing is that he is expressing gratitude. Epaphroditus had been sent by the church from Philippi to Paul, and I believe in Rome, and he had been bringing things that Paul would have needed. And when he came, Epaphroditus took very ill, extremely ill, and whenever he returned from Paul's presence back to Philippi, he took the letter with him. And Epaphroditus was recognized and thanked, and Paul is thanking the Philippian Christians for their support at that time. Secondly, the people in Philippi, the Christians in Philippi, had financially supported Paul. We know that on at least two or three occasions, they had sent a financial gift to Paul to actually support him, and that is repeated within the book as well. And finally, he thanks the believers for their prayers, and that is the dominant part of the first part of chapter 1. And so therefore, the first thing that Paul does is he writes from prison telling people, thank you. It's not a bad thing to recognize and to thank people. Sometimes we think that, sometimes in our culture anyway, that you just assume that, you know, everything's okay. It's very nice for people just to send a text or to ring up or to just send a letter or a card thanking. And for missionaries out in the field, it is imperative to follow Paul's example that whenever they receive financial assistance or insistence, assistance in any form, that they, they write back to thank the church. It is a biblical principle of showing gratitude. But that wasn't the only reason he wrote the book. He also wrote it to encourage the Christians. He encourages them in many ways. He says, I am confident that you conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Conduct, conduct. He's encouraging them to live as a Christian in a Roman world, not as a Roman, in a Christian, in a, not as a Christian, I get that right, as a Christian in a Roman world, and not to ignore his Christianity in the Roman world. And secondly, he also is encouraging them to show humility. One of the things that was characteristic of people who lived in a colony, and in particular Roman citizens who lived in a colony, was a certain degree of arrogance. Humility was not something which was part of their culture. And whenever Paul writes to them, he expresses and shows to them the example of the Lord Jesus Christ in chapter 2, that well-known passage that many of us will know off by heart. <clears throat> and he talks to them about their humility and the example being our Lord Jesus Christ. And the third thing that he does is he talks to them about them, their, their um, 
resolving their differences. There are a number of names mentioned at the end of the book. There are two women's names mentioned and a man's name. The two women had obviously some kind of difference. We don't know who they are. But how would you have liked to have had your name on Paul's epistle for the rest of history? Think about it. I wonder what they thought when they read their names or heard their names read. And whenever you contrast that to the name of a man who is mentioned, and he is thanked for his work directly in the same verses. And so therefore, he's encouraging people to resolve their differences. We don't know what the differences were. We may tease that out as we go through the week. But to resolve their differences, to live in humility, and to conduct themselves in a manner which is worthy of being a Christian. The second thing here, the third thing he says to them is to focus on standing firm. One of the problems that the church in Philippi was having, and Paul had this constantly, was that as Paul moved around and preached the gospel, those who were called Judaizers came along afterwards with an alternative gospel, and they preached this alternative gospel, and they tried to undermine everything that Paul had said and taught the people who were there. And he, this was happening in Philippi. And Paul says, look, stand firm. Trust what you've been told. Don't give up. Stand firm with what I have taught you. And then he says to them as well, to discover their joy. He says, you are my joy and my crown. And let's deal with the word crown first. Whenever we talk about crowns, we think of a crown, which is what a king puts on or a queen puts on their head, and it's a sign of royalty, whatever it might be. But in the case of this passage, it's not referring to that. It's referring to a crown, the type of crown that would have been given to a victor in a race, a laurel wreath sort of event. Somebody who had achieved something great would have been given this crown to recognize his or her achievement. And Paul is saying that you, that church, are an achievement. And because of that, because of my crown which I've received, because of what has happened to you in Philippi, you are my joy. And this is where the word joy repeats itself time and time and time and time again through the book of Philippians. So why were they his joy? If you were to go to Philippi today, you would be taken on a tour of the ancient city. And let's go on that tour. The first place you would possibly be taken to would be the riverbank where Lydia of Thyatira was washing and was meeting. A group of women had met there, and they, about, they met to pray. And it was highly likely that when they got to that river, that they were there because there was no synagogue in the city. If there had been 10 Jewish men in the city, they would have been entitled to have a synagogue. But these women met down there at the river, and the apostle Paul sought them out and went, and he met with them. And he met with Lydia. And it was there that we have the very first convert in Europe. And it's interesting, it's a woman. It's a woman. Don't forget in, which the, in the world in which people lived at that time, that the world looked upon men as superior to women, that women were not given the recognition that they would have today in our society. And yet the very, very first Christian to bring the message into Europe, or to receive the message in Europe, was a woman. The Bible holds women in great esteem. The first person to see the resurrection or to witness the resurrection of Christ was a woman. And so we find that women are held in a very high place within Scripture, and in particular, Lydia of Thyatira. We don't know if she stayed there. She was a seller of purple. 
And we do know that there was a church established in Thyatira, and that Lydia may even have been instrumental in establishing that, because we read about it in the book of Revelation later on. That is a hypothesis. There's no evidence for it, but it's a possibility. And so if you went along to uh, Philippi today, you would be taken to this river. And you'd say, this is where the women met. And this is where the Apostle Paul came, and there's a church that's been built there now as well. And this is where the gospel was very first preached in Europe. And when it was preached in Europe, the first convert was Lydia, this woman. And secondly, you may be taken along to what they claim to be the house or possibly the home of Luke, the beloved physician. Whenever you read the Acts account, it's written by Luke. And whenever you come to the Acts account, it is a very, very interesting change in the pronouns from they to we and back to they. And whenever Luke is talking about his experience in Philippi, he's using the pronoun we. And after they leave Philippi, again, look, when after Paul leaves Philippi, Paul, Luke again uses the pronoun they. And all of the evidence is that Luke was, in some way, possibly even lived in Philippi. He was a Gentile. He wasn't a Jew. And he lived across there, across the water. And at some stage in his past experience, while he had traveled around in the Middle East, possibly even Jerusalem, we don't know. There's no evidence for it, so we can only speculate. But at some point in that stage, Luke had become a Christian, and he followed Paul on his second missionary journey, his third missionary journey, as well as his second missionary journey to Philippi. Paul, whenever he left Philippi, left Luke behind. And Luke, in many ways, became the leader of that little fledgling church and encouraged it to grow. It's interesting that whenever Paul came to church plant, that was a methodology that he used. He brought the gospel, he proclaimed the message, he established the church, he left men who were there, he could depend upon and charge, and then he moved on. And the third person, or the third person you might find, is a jail. When you go to Philippi, they will take you to this Roman jail. And it is there that we read the great account in Acts chapter 16 of how Paul was arrested and he was put into prison. Whenever Paul refers to that arrest in Philippi, he uses words to describe it as saying, I was treated terribly. I was treated harshly. I was treated in an inappropriate way. And Paul was taken and Silas were taken and they were locked up in possibly this building. And they were down in the depths of that building. And while they were down in the depths of that building, they were singing praises to God. And the other prisoners around about heard them. And as they were there in their chains and their stocks and locked up and in that terrible situation, having been beaten, they were singing praises to God. And the prisoners were listening. And all of a sudden, into the midst of that environment came an earthquake. Now, I don't know if you've ever been in an earthquake, but I have been in many an earthquake having been brought up in Japan. But I'll tell you something. The most terrifying place to have been in an earthquake was somewhere that you couldn't get out of. The doors locked, you in chains. And the whole place shook, and the chains were snapped, and the doors flung open, but the man did not, did not flee. And the jailer came in with his, with, his, with his sword and he was about to commit suicide whenever Paul told him to stop and, and to not commit suicide. And at that point, the jailer asked a question which has resonated right throughout history. What must I do to be saved? Had he heard the singing of Paul? Had he heard the witness of Paul and Silas? What must I do to be saved? And Paul answered him with those words which have in many ways captured the essence of the gospel. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. So when Paul had led this jailer to Christ, he was baptized and the rest of his family became Christians. 
And so when Paul, possibly 15 years after that visit to Philippi, is writing back to that church and saying to them, you are my joy and my crown, what is he referring to? He's referring to those early believers who had come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, who had come to know him as their personal Savior, and who were continuing in the midst of difficult circumstances to grow and to show love and compassion and to follow Christ. Paul's joy was that as he preached the message of the gospel, people responded People came to faith, and people grew in their faith. And as a Christian, there is no greater joy for us than to see an individual realizing their need of Jesus Christ as their own and personal Savior, coming to faith in Him, placing their trust in Him, and continuing to grow in Him. That is the joy that we are talking about. We're not talking about some bubbly, superficial joy, but a lasting joy which is there constant and into eternity. So Discovering Joy is the the title. Written from a prison cell. Written to the first church in Western Europe. In Europe. The first church, the first convert, a woman. The first, the second convert, a jailer. The third convert, a family. And Paul leaving Luke behind to bring that small nucleus of believers together, and that church grows and grows and grows and becomes his joy. As he looks back over his life, he says, look what happened in Philippi. Look what happened here. But Philippi was right up there with him. The Lord Jesus Christ tells us, go ye into all the world, and tell people about me. That is our commission. That is what we are to do. That is what we do here week in and week out and through our activities. We tell people about the Lord Jesus Christ because it is only through him and faith in him that you can have that eternal joy, that confidence, that trust, that ability to be absolutely assured that God is in control. Paul says, live as Christians in a Roman colony. Show humility. Show care for each other. Stand firm. And you are my joy. Over the next number of weeks, we'll be taking Philippians step by step and looking at it in significantly more detail and looking at how it speaks into us in a difficult environment today and how it can bring joy and rejoicing into our lives. Let's close in prayer. Our gracious God and Father, we thank you that we can have a joy that only comes from yourself, a joy which is confident and trusting, a joy which is the fruit of the Spirit, a joy which can only come from you, and a joy which is available to us through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, our Father, for these early believers in Philippi. We thank you, our Father, that their faith was so strong that the message from Philippi resonated and carried throughout the world to where we are today. Father, help us to realize the real joy is serving you. The real joy is leading men and women to know you. The real joy is living for you. And so, our Father, we thank you for this little book, this little letter which Paul has written, and the many messages and many truths that are going to be contained within it, and which will help us in our lives here in the 21st century today. And so, our Father, we thank you for our time together. In the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you, David, for that introduction um, to this new series and for outlining the context behind the first church in Europe. We're going to close this, um, this evening's service by singing the words of O Church Arise. Once again, I want to thank you for joining with us this evening. And after we've sung this hymn, 
our service will be over. So let's stand to sing, O Church Your Eyes, after the introduction. <laughs>